Uh, we are part of this consortium and we're actually leading the work package communication and dissemination. So we were the one uh, entitled to organize and, and lead on this, uh, on this webinar today. But today you will also meet other consortium members uh, that will really share with you um, all the, the achievements so far of this uh, research uh, and innovation project. Uh, so I'm quite glad you really take the chance to, to stay with us today. Um, Besides that, uh, uh, just on a technical note, please mute yourself, but I think all of us already did it, so we are quite now aware of uh, uh, how to handle this webinar so after, after a while they've been working from home. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, um, if you want to engage with us also through Twitter, because the Boost project has a Twitter account, a LinkedIn account, we are using a, a, an hashtag, Boost Approach, you will soon discover also what is our boost approach for mental health resilience. And uh, last but not least, today we are going to launch after, after the seminar, this policy brief that we, we wrote uh, in the consortium, uh, and it will be also explained during this, uh, this webinar. So also stay tuned for uh, all this document that we hope uh, uh, you will find useful and you will pass on to your colleagues uh, um, the comment those that could be interested in mental health resilience. So today we have a, a very distinguished panel, uh, as I said, Boost members, uh, um, of the consortium, but also European Commission to set the context, and, uh, uh, and colleagues from uh, uh, an health association in Brussels that they've been following our journey through uh, this, uh, this project. So um, I would like to start now with uh, Vladimir Garkov uh, from the European Commission DG Education and Culture. Vladimir is actually policy officer, uh, unit schools and multilinguals, um, and is an old friend of Boost. Um, so it's nice to be connected again through this uh, um, <laughs> social media and through and through through internet. So Vladimir, the the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Valentina. Uh, it is uh, really a pleasure to join you again. It's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, there is a lot going on, as you know, especially in, uh, in those uh, um, difficult times for everyone. Um, uh, can I move to the first uh, slide, please? Um, I will uh, just mention a little bit about uh, the origin of uh, our thinking, which is based on uh, mm, the ages-old approach to uh, comprehensive competence-based education. And then uh, I will provide the example of science, which is, uh, I think, a good one. Then we'll move on to uh, the framework, um, uh, JRC and the Commission, uh, I mean in, in DGAAC, because JRC is also part of the Commission, the Joint, Joint Research Center, uh, is um, uh, we delivered in the beginning of um, July, and uh, finally we'll mention about what's going on at this point. Thank you. Next one. Um, the key competencies approach to education is, as I said, uh, thousands of years old, actually. It started back in the uh, times of ancient Greece. And uh, in 2018, an update of the key competencies framework was uh, delivered um, in May 2018. As you can see here, we have eight key competencies. And uh, uh, the uh, personal, social, and learning to learn sits at the core, in the middle. Um, I, uh, the um, basic skills, so to speak, literacy and science and uh, uh, math are um, basic. They're the fundamentals for everything. However, the non-cognitive non aspects, which are the personal, social, and learning to learn, are determining the success of our educational efforts. The next one, please. When you see where, uh, as you can see, we stand in a very difficult situation in terms of accomplishment. Uh, nearly one more than one-fifth of our young 15-year-olds are not doing well. They are not scoring above the level two of PISA. 
And in some countries, like the country I come from, Bulgaria, nearly half of them are functionally literate. And the same applies to the other basic skills, literacy as well as maths. Next one, please. What could we do? As I said, key competencies is the way to go. And this is the competence-based education, which includes uh, the, a key competence basically Me, what does this mean? It means knowledge, skills, and attitudes. These are the three aspects. Uh, why do we call them key? And what is the difference between a key competence and just, let's say, a professional competence? Well, uh, it's, uh, uh, the key competences are applied to all individuals. They're, they are mostly, uh, it's, they're developed in a lifelong learning con context throughout our lives. However, the expectation is, especially in the EU context, and you're, uh, to accomplish this, hopefully, by the end of uh, secondary schooling. Um, the other important aspect is that we are talking about a whole person. We are not just talking one or two, oh, this is enough and the person can fulfill his or her potential. No, we want to prepare our students to, for the uh, for future um, successful life and it's need, all of the eight competences are needed, including culture awareness, including digital, including um, languages and uh, uh, so it is uh, really important to come to understand the comprehensiveness of this approach next one please and as i mentioned uh, as you can see uh, the non-cognitive parts are crucial here personal social and learning to learn uh, how can we uh, develop those because without them as evidence points out we are not uh, we are not going to be successful. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, the evidence is clear. If we look at the educational accomplishments, yes, intelligence plays a huge role. However, conscientiousness of the big five dimensions in psychology, well known, uh, emotional stability, agreeableness, and especially openness and conscientiousness are evidently it's as, as, uh, nearly as important in your ability to, as your ability to think. Next one, please. And here it is, another uh, important uh, piece of evidence. Unfortunately, PISA will not be delivered this year. However, um, the evidence from the previous cycle clearly indicates that, uh, for example, as, as I mentioned uh, with uh, science, uh, self-efficacy, which is the ability to uh, comprehend, uh, to manage your own, uh, uh, your own learning, your own emotions, your own behaviors, being able to, uh, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to navigate the complexity of, uh, as we call it, meta-learning. Uh, those, uh, those aspects, those skills, I would say, appear of extremely important, of a very high importance. I mean, in some countries, as you can see, like Singapore, New Zealand, Ireland, this is nearly up to one year that they make a contribution which is equi equivalent to one year of schooling. And across the OECD, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's like 20 points. Next one, please. The same thing applies also to job performance. In other words, we talked about only the importance of, the, of this importance in, in, in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, education, but then in the end, uh, the same um, uh, um, evidence is uh, showing in uh, studies um, looking at the effect of these non-cognitive skills on job performance. Next one, please. Here it is, our life comp framework that I mentioned uh, uh, the Commission uh, developed is one of the, you know, we have already developed three competences, uh, three detailed frameworks on, on three of the eight competences. One is on digital, the other one is on entrepreneurship, and this is the third one. Uh, now, it is very nice, how could I say, it's a conceptual model. It's a conceptual model which consists of four major branches. You know, uh, we have the social, 
the personal, and the learning to learn. And each one of those branches has three other branches that cover uh, as you can see, well-being, flexibility, and self-regulation when we're talking about the personal, then in terms of social, it's communication, cooperation, and empathy. And finally, the learning to learn aspect is, uh, uh, um, is certainly uh, consists of what I already mentioned, uh, managing learning, critical thinking, growth mindset. So I encourage you all to have a look and see because those uh, three competencies, digital entrepreneurship and this one, have uh, uh, have been taken up by member states widely and they serve as a reference tool. Now, next one, please. We will not stop here. We will continue working. So the key point here is that this is a life com is a central competence within the context of the of the key competence framework. The development of uh, of uh, this more detailed uh, uh, life com will lead eventually to hope and hopefully to some con to some curriculum developments and uh, changes. And uh, the, our next step beyond to go beyond um, the creation of this uh, um, conceptual model is to work on uh, assessment tools and implementation and we are already involved uh, I mean by we I mean the DG Act, uh, involved in, in our unit in particular involved in the further work with JRC uh, trying to um, to help uh, member states to uh, implement and develop, uh, as I said, uh, assessment tools in the fu for future uh, uh, use. Next one, please. Now, uh, we are uh, at a pivotal moment in the development of uh, not only our uh, help for the member states, but also a pivotal moment for the uh, European Union, in my view. Uh, because, as you know, this is how the immune system works. Something that doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So what uh, will happen, uh, and uh, we are working towards that, is to use... Um, the opportunity of the current crisis and the changed uh, landscape of, uh, uh, across the EU in terms of education, that those challenges will actually um, open up an opportunity for us to, f to become closer, to see the need to cooperate better and to learn from each other. That's, uh, I would say, uh, the vision of the founders of, uh, of, the, of the EU, and uh, we are hoping to become even uh, more uh, effective in, in, in our work. So, uh, just in September, we had uh, uh, two main documents delivered. One is uh, on the European education area, that particular one is uh, uh, extremely important because by, within five years, the idea is uh, for us to create a common, uh, you know, we have a common market, but what about a common, a common education area that uh, will uh, facilitate uh, uh, the acquisition of, uh, of the life skills, including uh, the, and especially I would say, I would, uh, let me see if I could, uh, even uh, mention here specifically what they say, uh, what uh, the, this document particularly says about well-being. It's, it's about supportive learning environments, especially for the groups of risk at risk of underachievement. And well-being at school is, uh, uh, you know, the cornerstone of those efforts. Then we have um, another document, which is the digital education plan, uh, also adopted um, in September uh, uh, by the college. And, and that particular one goes beyond the point of uh, just, um, you know, ensuring digital literacy across Europe. Uh, but it specifically indicates that the protection of health and well-being is one of its, ma is, is a major goal. Uh, it is imperative uh, actually, um, for educators and institutions to ensure that young users are able to avoid health risks and threats to physical and psychological well-being while using digital technology. Why am I saying this? Why is it so 
crucial. Because as you know, we went online uh, big time and uh, digital technology, and uh, as uh, I recently received a letter from an Italian citizen that which I had to answer, uh, is actually an epidemic no less dangerous than COVID in many ways. Uh, actually, data for Generation Z, those who are, you know, teenagers today, uh, indicates disturbing, uh, um, uh, disturbing trends, uh, for, especially for young women uh, and girls, 14, 13, 14, uh, up 19 years old. And uh, uh, the difference between this cohort with the previous uh, um, co cohort of students is huge in terms of self-harm, in terms of uh, uh, um, unleashing of what they say is kind of relationship aggression. And, and boys are not really that affected, it seems to be, because they are less, they are more physical, which is uh, less uh, psychologically and mentally disturbing to them. So, um, so we have, do have huge challenges as as we go as we go uh, along with uh, 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 with uh, the transition to uh, a lot of much more online learning. We are basically neglecting in many ways, uh, inadvertently, uh, the the normal social and personal de behavior uh, development of our children. So this is a major challenge. And finally, I just wanted to mention the Green Deal, of course, which is, as you know, one of the maybe the most important uh, commission uh, um, document. Uh, that particular one also refers to a European framework on climate change and sustainable development. As you can imagine, this will be our fourth uh, um, framework with the, where we are going to uh, draw on life comp, on the previous, on the inter, inter entrepreneurship, on digital, on citizenship, and of course, mostly and on science, uh, which is really the core of uh, our, uh, moving from awareness of the, of the environmental issues, moving to uh, understanding, and then to action at community and personal level. Next one, please. Yes, that's all. I hope I was able to make it in time. You were more than in time, <laughs> perfectly, really. Thanks, Vladimir. Uh, I, I didn't say indeed that uh, those that want to engage in conversation, please uh, do it through the use of uh, the chat, uh, and I will revert then to, to the speaker. So anytime you feel you want, to, you have a burning question, please just use uh, the chat, and I will uh, I will let there extend the question after afterwards to the speaker. Um, I would suggest now, uh, I don't see any question right now, but I mean, take your time, and there will be plenty of time also for the panel debate, and I'm pretty sure that then we can uh, we can move forward with discussion also with the audience. And, uh, and now maybe it's important to give the floor indeed to um, our booth coordinator, uh, so to Stina Hölle Breiten, um, I hope, hopefully I said it correctly, uh, scientific coordinator of the BOOST project and Stina will introduce you to uh, the progress made so far uh, with BOOST. So Stina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Valentina. And hi, everyone. It's nice to, I should say see you, but I'm not seeing many of you, but I see many familiar names. So it's, uh, it's good to connect. So um, you can skip to the next slide. Um, I'm going to be saying a little bit about the project for those of you who have not attended or read about the project or attended any of our um, seminars before. Um, just briefly about the project. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about the basis for what we call the boost approach, which, which is the innovation that we are developing in this project. It's a research and innovation project. Um, and I'm going to say a little bit about the Boost approach and its elements and about implementation, uh, which has started. Uh, next slide. So what we try to do in the Boost project is we try to create uh, an approach to strengthen social and emotional skills in school children. Um, we have, we're focusing on primary schools. Um, the, the aim is to promote mental health and well-being, and we're doing this through strengthening the teachers so that the teachers or the school staff can strengthen the children. Next. Um, our consortium is uh, 
as Valentina said, Centre is the coordinator and I'm the scientific coordinator. I also have a project coordinator with me, Gloria Zaldi, who's also at Centre. Um, we have uh, partners in Poland, AWF, uh, in Poznan. We have partners in Spain, uh, University of Córdoba. Uh, we have a partner in Norway, the Viking County Municipality, who's leading work package eight and who will be speaking after me today. Um, we have Eurega, Valentina, that you've already met uh, in our consortium, and we also have uh, a school owner in Norway, a municipality, Modum, which is also where we're doing the implementation and which is our school owner partner. Next. This is, <laughs> um, gives you an idea what the project looks like. Uh, so as I said, it's a research and innovation project. So uh, we are doing a various uh, different research components. We started with the formative study, which was uh, consisted of a literature review, uh, interviews, qualitative interviews in school contexts in three countries. Well, I forgot to say we're doing this in Norway, Spain, and Poland. So that the, we're developing and testing our innovation in the three countries. So we did the research, the qualitative research in the three countries, and we also did a review of policies uh, in the three countries. And this is the basis for what we call the boost approach, uh, which is the innovation. And I'll say a little bit more about that afterwards. And we're also measuring. Um, we're looking at the, the process of the implementation, which is work package four. Um, we are measuring the economic effects and the effect on the children and on the school staff that are um, receiving the, the intervention. So it's a case control. So we. Uh, we are measuring the effects in the schools where we're doing the intervention and we have a control group of schools where we are not doing any intervention. Uh, and then of course we have the work packages of dissemination which is led by Eurega and work package 8 which is the uptake and exploitation work package which is led by Viken which you will be hearing from later. Next. Uh, so this is, as I said, the basis for the boost approach. We did the review of the literature policies and we did some qualitative studies. So you can go to the next and I'll tell you a little bit about what we found. When we went through the policies um, in all three countries, we see that the need for or the importance of social and emotional learning is emphasized in policies at all levels, uh, national, regional, local levels. Um, in summary, what I can say is that what we see from the policies is that while it's uh, clear that this is important and that social and emotional learning is at the core and should be at the core and should be prioritized, there's, the policies lack clear strategies and obligations on how schools should work with this. Um, so that's, and uh, also Marit will say a little bit, uh, what she will be talking about um, our recommendations based on the findings that we have so far. So the policy recommendations that we have. Next. Um, what we see from research is that when we do the literature review uh, and we look at effective uh, social and emotional learning programs, uh, we see that effective programs, uh, they lead to in the short term and long term increased well-being in the children. So, so effective strategies that do promote social and emotional learning lead to increased well-being. Um, it's uh, as Vladimir also said in his, his talk before me now, we know that working with social and emotional learning and strengthening children leads to increased academic achievements. So social and emotional learning is at the core of actually achieving um, better academic scores. And in the long term, we also know that better academic achievement leads to increased success in the labor market. So, so this social and emotional learning is at the core of our achievements, short term and long term. Next. Um, in our interviews, uh, we, uh, we hear that school staff, parents and children, they all emphasize that there, is, that there, needs, there should be more focus on social and emotional learning uh, in primary schools. Uh, they emphasize that children need better social and emotional learning skills and that school staff need better social and emotional learning skills to teach children better skills. Next. It's essential and we see this both from our interviews. So this is a summary of interviews and literature we see from the literature in our interviews that it's essential that these programs take on a whole school approach. Um, there, there has, everyone has to be involved, the whole school, there has to be organizational learning. This is at the core of, of uh, implementing any program, but for so, social and emotional learning programs, this is essential. 
uh, and these programs should also be integrated into the whole school life, not just the classrooms. Um, a lot of programs today are very uh, problem solving progr programs, for instance, programs that uh, how to deal with bullying uh, when bullying has already occurred, whereas uh, the need for more promotive and preventive programs is emphasized both in the literature and in our interviews. Programs should be flexible and they should build on the actual needs and resources of the schools. Schools are very different. The way schools are run is, are very, is very different. Uh, so a, a very rigid program where you have to do this and this and this in a certain time in a certain way um, are, not, uh, are not very effective. The best programs are the ones that take into account the real needs and resources of schools. Um, children, parents, and out-of-school partners must be involved, um, and it has to be continuous, continuous training, coaching, and mentoring of school staff, something that doesn't just, just take place over a short period of time, but something that happens all the time, that's integrated into school life. Uh, and also, we see that school staff are asking for very practical examples, like a toolbox of uh, how they can work with cell, very practical examples of how they can take cell into school life. Next. So um, let me introduce you to the boost approach. Next. Next. <laughs> Ingeborg, do you want to take the next slide? Have we lost Ingeborg? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Seems we have technical problems. There we go. Um, so what we've ended up with is an approach that uh, that is that takes on the what we call the service delivery model, which is the organizational learning component. And at the same time, we're also so so we're we're suggesting a way that schools can organize themselves to work more systematically with social and emotional learning in in throughout the whole school year in all of all elements of school. And we're giving, uh, we're suggesting ways that they can, tools that they can use and theoretical uh, um, themes that they can read and that they can use as a starting point for discussion and as a starting point for working with this. Uh, our initial thought was that we were going to, to have um, a, a, a manual that we were with uh, some lectures and some workshops that we could introduce into the schools, but we see that uh, an online platform is, is what, uh, what school staff are asking for, uh, more, than, um, more than, you know, having to go to lectures and taking time off to do that. An online platform is flexible. They can use it when they have the time and, and they can use it according to their own needs. Next. So we are uh, developing an online platform as we speak, which consists of um, suggestion for this organizational learning or the service uh, delivery model. Um, which is at the core. How do schools, how can schools organize themselves to work more systematically with social and emotional learning? Um, next. So this, uh, the service model suggests ways of organizing themselves uh, in the school uh, and, and activities that can be done. So it's, it's a suggestion, but the sc each school has to make their own service model or create their own social and emotional learning service or boost service. Next. Um, and we've, we also have introduced uh, themes and modules, which are more theoretical uh, uh, readings that uh, school staff can use as a starting point for discussion and as a starting point for learning. Some schools also work with other social and emotional learning programs. Um, and, and these can also be taken in and be used as a starting point for discussion and learning if schools are already working with something that they feel works for them. And we have also created a toolbox. Just one slide back. Um, a toolbox, oh, next, <laughs> there we go. The toolbox is, is very concrete tools on how they can use this, whether it's, uh, it's a strategy for how to, uh, to greetings or strategies for putting children together in groups or, so we have very concrete ways of working with social and emotional learning. Next. This is the, the, the online platform, uh, it's online, but at the moment it's password protected because we're doing research and we're measuring the use of the platform. So it's not open for everyone just yet, but it will be open for everyone and the password protection will be taken away. And we're developing this 
as we go along. So we now have a draft and we have something that schools can work with and we are constantly getting feedback from schools on how we can do things better and how we can develop it more according to their needs. Next. So this is my final slide. I just want to, <laughs> we are in the process of implementing, but as you can imagine, uh, as everyone else in this world, we are affected by COVID-19. So we started the implementation in schools early this year. Uh, and quite shortly after uh, the schools had started looking at this and started uh, working with uh, the boost approach, schools were closed throughout, in all of our countries, schools were closed and throughout Europe, I think schools were closed. Um, and now schools are slowly opening up again and we, we are restarting our implementation, uh, but we see that uh, schools are in a very difficult situation. It's a very difficult time to implement anything in schools. They are so pressed for time now with uh, everything that's happening with COVID-19 still and schools are opening and reopening and open, uh, you know, uh, closing. And so it's, it's, it's a very difficult time for implementation, but we are, we're trying our very best and we are certainly getting some feedback so that we can adjust our approach uh, and hopefully continue making it better and better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stina. Yeah, it's a very difficult time we've been discussing this, but it's also probably the time, the right time actually to, to introduce a big shift in uh, how we address this uh, uh, social and emotional learning skills in schools in Europe. So. Uh, we will find a way uh, as a consortium, as a project, and uh, I'm also very happy that the context that was set by, uh, by Vladimir, indeed, it's, uh, it's fitting what we are doing. So we hope really to contribute to the overall European framework uh, uh, with the outcome of this project over the years. So thanks. There are a couple of questions, but I would give the floor now to uh, first to Ozemarit and then uh, and then maybe before the panel uh, discussion we can address these two questions and uh, and uh, and then open up to the panel debate uh, so as I said Ozemarit um, Hovden uh, from uh, senior advisor public health uh, Viking County uh, Norway she's uh, the work uh, the, the, the leader of the work package eight uh, on the uptake of the boost approach uh, so she will guide us a bit on uh, on this around what is happening with this policy brief the recommendation that we uh, draft for you and uh, as I said before then the policy brief will be published on our website uh, the boost website and will be circulating through our social media so you will have the chance to really read it in uh, in details uh, but thanks for now I mean we, we should thank Ose for this uh, kindly introduction so Ose the floor is yours thank you uh, Valentina and good morning to everyone um, this um, uh, this policy brief is a delivery from uh, the work package eight um, but I will start to tell you um, about what is the proposed regarding the boost policy brief um, uh, I just have to put down so I can see the screen uh, while the findings show that social and emotional well-being and learning is addressed by educational policies there is a lack of consistency in policy formulation and implementation across policy levels, leading to insufficient resources and capacities to integrate and deliver high quality social and emotional learning programs in schools in a sustainable way. Uh, and Stine has presented uh, the preliminary findings of the formative study, so I will not emphasize that in my presentation. But the policy brief also include and discuss this, of course, uh, and the 13 recommendation I will present for you are based on the findings. So the following recommendations uh, can be followed to achieve more systematic work with cell and policies across policy levels. Yes, recommendation one, work with policies needs to be done systematically at all policy levels. There is a need to put more effort in systematically working with cell at European, national, regional and local levels. This is to ensure that policies on cell align across the relevant levels of government, enabling schools to deliver good quality, sustainable cell programs. 
and political awareness and expectations concerning how schools can and should systematically work with cells should be high up on the political agenda if countries want to achieve an economy of well-being. And you can see the model on the, the slide that shows people's well-being and economic growth are interdependent and mutually reinforcing. And I think that model is important to have in mind. Next, please. I just want to mention that uh, we have divided the recommendations into national, regional, local and school level. And we will start with uh, the national level. Recommendation two. There is a need for a set of obligatory goals and plans with measurable indicators in national policies. At national level, policies should include a set of goals and mandatory plans so that school owners and school staff feel obligated to work actively with CELL. Having a mandatory plan with measurable indicators or checks can make implementation goals verifiable, even though implementation itself might be done differently at school level or if schools use different tools. Next. Recommendation three, cell skills should be incorporated in teachers' education programs and prioritized equally with other core learning skills required in teacher education programs. Cell skills should also be incorporated in teachers' education on equal footing with other core competences like language, mathematics, science, and third languages. Good relationships to children are key to facilitate facilitating work with other competences and subjects in schools. Working with CELL helps ensures good relationships, which will in turn increase school achievement for children. And next. Recommendation four, EU countries should find inspiration in EU's eight key competences for lifelong learning. And Vladimir, he uh, talked about this in his uh, presentation, but I, I will repeat that European countries should draw inspiration from the EU's new eight key competences for lifelong learning, which places as much importance on personal and social learning development as other skills like languages, science, citizenships, entrepreneurships, and digital skills. This sends a signal that these are competences which are important to both children and adults and necessary to achieve an economy based on other indicators than GDP. Next. The next recommendations are uh, according to regional and school owner level, and this is different in the partner countries in the project. In Norway, the municipalities uh, are, are primary school owners, but uh, both in Spain and Poland, the regional level shared the responsibility with municipalities uh, regarding um, the primary schools. And the recommendation five, six, and seven are very connected to each other. Yes. Um, recommendation um, five, school owner must ensure that there is continuity and agreement between their cell policies and the cell policies in school. School owners must also work with cell in a more systematic way. School owners must take responsibility to ensure that a common thread runs from their policies to what school management and school staff are doing locally in order to avoid cell work from being an individual decision left up to individual school staff. And recommendation six, school owner policies must also develop clear plans and measurable indicators. School owners must develop robust cell policies to ensure that schools work systematically, systematically with cell as well. Just like with um, national policies and policies affecting schools should also come with mandatory plans and measurable indicators. Next. And uh, number seven is, as I said, uh, connected to five and six. School owners must ensure that policies on action and quality regarding work with cell are being developed in schools. School owners must mandate their schools to develop policies where quality and action uh, regarding work with cell in their schools are encouraged and are in line with school owner policies. 
Next. Recommendation eight, school owners should put into place non-bureaucratic systems for reporting on defined goals. School owners must have systems for reporting the clearly defined goals. The reporting uh, must be easy to follow up and not bureaucratic or burdensome to the already administratively burdened schools. In recommendation nine, School owners must ensure that there are available resources for working with cell at school level. School owners must make resources available uh, which schools can use to follow up this type of work in their schools. And now we are on um, school level. Recommendation 10, cell must be included in all school strategies and policies. School leaders should have the responsibility to ensure that teachers practice and develop their cell skills to work effectively with cell in school. On the other hand, there must be clear expectations to school personnel about working with cell and about capacity building. On the other hand, school staff need knowledge and support to work with cell. And working with cell is a part of academic teaching and not separate. Development of cell competences must happen during every interpersonal encounter in various situational contexts. Recommendation 11, school strategies must include time for capacity building of school staff. At school level, strategies must also ensure that teachers have time for capacity building and individual cell practice. And recommendation 12, school strategies must emphasize preventive and promotive cell work. And the last recommendation, recommendation 13, school strategies should be based on previous strategies which have been shown to work. A whole school approach is important to build a cell mindset and culture in school. It is also important that work with cell not be left to a few individuals in school. And furthermore, furthermore, it's necessary to create a collective responsibility to achieve the individual effect of cell in the classroom. And it's also important to build cell expertise from within schools and not be reliant on outside expertise. And teachers want concrete tools for working with cell. And the strategies should coordinate with partners outside of schools, including parents. Yes, next. And finally, the conclusion. The BOOST project is uh, currently developing an approach which aims to build cell capacity of school staff and providing schools with a model for service delivery to ensure a whole school approach. And we hope that uh, the results of the implementation of the approach in our test schools will confirm that the BOOST approach is a good way of working with cell in schools. But however, creating an approach for schools to use is not enough if necessary policies are not in place. With the recommendations listed above, we hope to draw attention to the need for policy implementation at all levels in order to promote cell at school level. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ozan. Thanks. Um, before moving forward to the panel debate, there is a question that actually I actually would like to address to Stina uh, that we receive in the chat. And it's uh, if a project will continue another year, how to take into account risk of contamination between intervention and control schools? Because I think it's very interesting in this question. So I was curious to know. It's a, it's a very interesting and relevant question. I think it was yeah. relevant even, even without an extension, possible extension. Yeah. Um, um, we, we can't control and make sure that there is no contamination to our control schools. Um, but of course, we're not working actively in the control schools and we're not introducing the boost approach uh, to the control schools, only to the intervention schools. And because the approach is, um, the platform is closed, um, we, um, they are not being um, introduced to the platform and the boost approach. Having said that, 
Oh, I, in all of our countries, I think most schools work with cell in one way or another. So we've, we, we've tried before we started the implementation to assess what kind of work they already do with cell. Um, but another interesting issue <laughs> regarding the, the effect study is that uh, we are now seeing that in all likelihood we will be measuring the effect of COVID-19 more than we will be measuring the effect of our implementation. Um, so, because of COVID-19, the implementation is being, um, it's still happening, but not in the way that we had foreseen. And also we see now that the children are probably much more affected by COVID-19 than they will be affected by our intervention. So, we'll certainly have interesting data, but whether we'll be able to measure the effect of the, of the boost approach, that remains to be seen. Thank you. Thank you, Sina. So uh, it's time now for the panel debate. Um, and I really would like to give the floor to uh, each and one of the panelists to introduce themselves. We, we heard about Vlad from Vladimir already. Um, but before addressing a couple of questions to you, uh, I would like to give the floor so that you can introduce yourself, the organization that you pre represent. And uh, so I will start with uh, Ingrid. Please. Can you see me? Yes, Ingrid. Okay, I can't see myself, which is a bit odd, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I'll just start. I don't, maybe it's the view options. I'll just play very quickly. Uh, no. Okay, I'll just start. Um, well, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to be uh, part of this really interesting discussion that sets um, indirectly, <laughs> so core to our work. Um, I'm Ingrid Stegeman and I'm program manager at EuroHealthNet. And we are um, a partnership of public bodies working in the um, field of health promotion and disease prevention. So we have health in our title, but it's really looking at the, uh, what can be done to keep people out of, uh, of treatment and care and what can be really done to boost their health. Um, and we also focus very much on the issue of health inequalities and um, what can be done to um, address these. Um, and our members, again, are public health institutes uh, and regional and local authorities, um, as well as uh, research bodies. And we work also in the field of uh, policy practice and research and bringing these together. So um, we've worked on numerous uh, uh, projects, um, much like this one, um, on, on other areas. But, um, but some of these um, have focused very much on the issue of um, of what can be done to reduce inequalities amongst young children and families, because that really is at the cornerstone of reducing health inequalities, um, address and, and, and shaping the life course, obviously. So we, for example, um, have coordinated, uh, it's called the Gradient Project and the Drivers Project that looked uh, specifically at these issues. More recently, we coordinated the Inherit Project, which investigated how we can change our lifestyles and our behaviors to live, move, and consume um, in ways that benefit um, the environment, as well as our health and health and, and equity, um, doing this simultaneously because so much of what's good for the environment is also good for our health. And one of the key recommendations was really to um, to education for sustainability. And cell is at the core of this, as we've heard, and and uh, we'll talk later. But um, but that's really important. And then also more recently, we've uh, we're also part of the EU Joint Action on Chronic Diseases, um, mm -hmm. CROTUS Plus, that recently. Um, well, we recently had the final conference and we uh, coordinated the, the work on health promotion there and, the, and the, that which focused on the transfer and exchange of good practice. One of those practices was on physical activity, um, the transfer and implementation of the Irish school flag, uh, the um, uh, um, active school flag program. And I feel like there are a lot of parallels in terms of getting physical activity in school curricula, which is also so important to health and uh, or to educational outcomes, um, but uh, so difficult nevertheless to to really structure um, school programs around this too. That's uh, that's so integral to well-being and uh, and um, uh, children. So I will leave it at that. But uh, but again, thank you for organizing this and <laughs> and putting this very important issue um, up front. 
Thanks, Ingrid. And uh, indeed, uh, with your help, Net and Uriga, we've been working on health promotion and prevention. And this is why also Uriga is interested in this project, the Boost project, uh, because for us, promotion and prevention is like the key and the pillar for uh, health for all in Europe, actually. Um, I would like also now to pass the floor to uh, Kato. Um, Kato is one of our uh, partners in the Boost Consortium and is representing Modu Municipality. Uh, Ketel, the floor is yours for a brief introduction. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will keep this uh, keep this uh, brief. I'm I'm head of development for uh, for schools in uh, in Modum municipality uh, in Norway. Uh, quite a small municipality uh, with uh, with um, sixteen hundred uh, students uh, in in primary school. Um, we are now working on uh, on uh, re uh, renewing the curriculum in in schools, and uh, and uh, we are uh, implementing the uh, more uh, important pers perspective of of life ma mastery in uh, in children and uh, young people. So, well being and and SEL uh, is uh, is very important in this in this work, um, and. Uh, We'd just like to add that uh, we are really excited to be part of the consortium and the project from uh, from uh, all the beginning. So uh, uh, this is uh, very uh, exciting and and uh, and uh, yeah, important for us. Thank you. Thanks. We also know that there was a big, uh, let's say, bottom up approach to this project. There was really the need uh, in a geographical area, your geographical area to, to tackle this, this issue. So this is why you also get in touch then with Sinta for the research center to, to really uh, try to, to tackle that from a scientific point of view with, uh, with also um, a European framework and uh, cross-border cooperation. So thanks because it's nice to see when something, when there is a need on a territory and how much the territory and the regional and local health authorities can do to, to boost for, uh, for innovation uh, uh, on the ground. So thank you. Uh, now uh, I would like to ask to Eva, uh, again, another member of our consortium to introduce herself and the uh, organization that she's representing the University of Cordoba. Eva, the floor is yours. Good morning. First, I would like to thank the invitation and the opportunity to participate in this webinar uh, and to share this space with uh, the speaker and colleagues. It is an innovative and very necessary initiative, mainly at this moment in, in that the pandemic situation impacts hard in our well-being and particularly in children. Uh, I am professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Cordoba. My research interests include social, emotional and moral competence and quality of interpersonal relationships. I coordinate different projects. One of them is the Spanish team we have boost, coordinated together with Olga Gomez and in which uh, Rosario Ortega, Rocio Luque, Antonio Camacho and Andrea Roldan participate. This pro project aim to the analysis of risks and projective factors of school violence and the promotion of the well-being of school children. Currently, I'm a, I am a member of a network of researchers who are worldwide organized to respond to the latent needs of our society in terms of well-being and mental health. From this alliance, two important research projects are developed. The first explore the relationship of, between violence and uh, well-being, and the second currently underway aims to explore the impact of lockdown on adolescents in 20 countries around the world. The main conclusion is that we need a global approach and commitment if we want to be successful in our efforts to keep children mentally healthy. This knowledge will be important for practitioners and, and families as well as policymakers. Most importantly, we have the responsibility of researchers to carry out the best and most rigorous research possible if we want to improve children's mental well-being. In Boost project, our Spanish team is responsible of the effectiveness evaluation of Boost approach in children, in children well-being, in terms of socio-emotional competence, resilience, healthy relationships, and prevention and violence problems. We work together for that Boost approach impacts on children well-being, and the international community face a high social challenge, no more than ever, that requires research attention and educational and political proposals adjusted to the social situation that we are experiencing. 
provinces. In BOOST, we work together to develop rigorous empirical research to better understand the effect of the intervention design on children's well-being. We advance in the design and practice of an effective intervention model that includes accurate and international proposal that ensure a happy, safe and healthy development. Thank you. Thanks, Eva. And last but not least, we have Robert with us. So, Robert, please, the, the floor is yours for uh, an introduction. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> Can you hear me? Excellent. I listened carefully to um, all the um, uh, previous speakers. Um, hello, good morning, everyone, once again. Um, what can I say about myself? Um, um, you wrote here on the presentation that professionally I come from the background of uh, psychology, of uh, clinical psychology and psychotherapy. Actually, I lived kind of a schizophrenic life because uh, there was a huge chapter in my life when I basically, I was attached to the uh, psychiatry department, to the uh, sub-department of uh, medically applied um, psychology. And I worked with um, a variety of people that were in um, really mentally bad shapes, uh, beginning on neurotics and ending, ending up on, on psychotic people that were detached from, from reality. I also worked with uh, youngsters and young people that were having um, severe problems. I um, collaborated in New Zealand with some schools, tried to assist uh, um, especially children that were having a um, problem with fitting into an um, educational um, environment. Um, at the moment, I'm trying to, to survive working in Poland on Polish universities. This is the reason that I am part of the um, Polish team. Uh, and I am trying to, to contribute to what is happening in our project. Um, I am just trying to do uh, my tiny bits and pieces, um, hopefully, which can be used in uh, developing and implementing the um, boost project um, uh, also in Poland. Um, so this is um, and the sort of thing, there's the, there were, um, uh, it's probably not a good moment now, but there was one worry that was really on my mind as I listened, um, as I especially listened to, to Vladimir. Um, he was using, for example, such term like uh, liberal education, liberal education, uh, if I could maybe use another term, pro-democratic education. Uh, in Poland, we have a, a major problem, which seems that our education uh, failed in terms of uh, educating people that are pro-democratic, pro-tolerance, pro-openness, uh, pro-liberal education uh, people because we have a major shift into right-wing authoritarian uh, political direction, which is really worrying and dangerous. And it rises automatically a question to what extent um, our education in the past failed in terms of uh, creating or helping to create people which are open-minded, which are culturally aware, which are tolerant uh, in terms of minorities, uh, doesn't matter if they're, they're, they're immigrants or people of uh, different sexual orientation. Um, we have a major problem about it now. And in this context, it seems like um, there's a lot of work uh, to be done that's supposed to be um, rooted in cell approach. Um, but uh, at the same time, the problems that we are experiencing making me think or maybe making me ask the question to what extent uh, we are going to win. Uh, it really worries me. So uh, I don't want to steal your time. Um, also, oh, there are another things that maybe I, I would like to comment on uh, as we get to the point of uh, any panel discussion. Thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, thanks uh, for everyone and also indeed for introducing one of the questions that I would like to address to the, the panelists, uh, which is how can social and emotional learning during childhood contribute to general mental health of children? What kind of children we can expect uh, if we really take care of them? Uh, introducing also this new new program. Uh, I would like to ask this question maybe to Ketel, if you wish to start. Yeah, of course, um, I'll start. Um, well, it's a quite leading uh, question, uh, Valentina, but, uh, but of course uh, it will contribute. Um, uh, one of the one of the main subjects and and um, uh, in in the proposal and and the program is is resilience and and the resilience is uh, uh, is uh, is built by uh, by more social and emotional learning so so resilience is is um, uh, is the main main aim and, and subject in in the project and and building building resilience throughout uh, childhood is uh, is important because because um, and, and through uh, tutorage and and uh, school uh, and uh, and of course the preschool uh, situations with uh, with the tutorage from from uh, professional uh, adults uh, will build a resilience uh, which will come in handy throughout life uh, later on so so um, well, it's uh, Dr. Martin Seligman uh, uh, quoted so uh, that uh, resilience is is uh, built by uh, adding small doses of of, uh, uh, of obstacles and uh, and uh, and difficulties and uh, and also coping with this throughout childhood. Uh, so um, we really strongly believe in in uh, in uh, professional and and uh, good uh, relations with with adults that uh, that might uh, help children uh, coming uh, overcoming and, and coping with the difficulties and of course the the covid-19 is is uh, is uh, not a small difficulty so so we are trying our best in uh, in uh, in schools in in modem and throughout europe thanks uh, Eva, do you want to complement on that? I mean, from uh, a different perspective, uh, uh, the perspective of uh, a professor, uh, an expert in psychology, uh, what's your opinion on that? Yes, we need social relationship and cell might be the key to, to help individuals adjust to social situation effectively. It's very important to learn the keys to be social and emotional competent Cell promote, uh, for one hand, prosocial behavior that requires emotional and social skills like empathy and cooperation. But cell, oh, cell also reduces antisocial behavior, more specifically, the inhibition of impulsive and disruptive behavior. Antisocial behavior has negative social outcomes that can be directed uh, toward others or toward the person uh, himself. In summary, effective participation and the ability to engage in social situations require social competence, such as sharing, cooperating, and understanding the perspective of others and inhibition of impulsive and disruptive behaviors. Social behavior in classroom can be influenced by a students' ability to manage their feeling, their feelings, emotions, and stress. And on, a, on the other hand, effective social competence can be related to the level of studying, students understanding the rules in social situations uh, and recover from strong emotions such as anger, peer neglect, and psychological adjustment. Thanks. And back to Robert now. So this is what was a bit lacking in, in Poland. Uh, should we reinforce the social and emotional learning skills? Is the CERC program uh, something that should embed it in, uh, in school across Europe, uh, everywhere, in order to have better adults also in the future? Uh, I, uh, I fully agree. It looks like um... Uh, the, the big social arena, which is um, like politics, for example, uh, in Poland, and what is going on on this huge arena may be seen in such a way that to some extent uh, we have some problems and we neglected issues on the smaller and area arenas. So um, if we assume that we learn to 
talk to people, to listen to people, to take their, the perspective of someone else who thinks differently. And we, we're supposed to learn it in the way that um, gives a permission to someone else to be different as long as we don't uh, invade and do not uh, run over uh, our mutual human rights, etc. So it seems like um, a, a quite a massive part of Polish population um, was treated not in the way or was not educated in the way that um, supported uh, development of a being which is open to differences, which is open for cultural differences, personal preferences and, and differences, and which are quite dogmatic, quite stagnant in their way of thinking. Uh, what even worse, um, there are people uh, which, are, which are full of aggression uh, and destruction. Uh, if you give an opportunity for this to spill over, it is just happening. And then obviously, uh, again, it's a, like a vicious cycle because people that want to protest against this style, this way of being toward another human beings, they, they also risking um, stepping into aggressive behavior. Um, if I leave on the side, because I don't want to bore you to death with uh, our Polish problems, uh, but it, it really seems like they may, may be rooted in, in um, somewhere in failure in education earlier on. It's very interesting. Um, maybe there's a, some tiny light in the refrigerator, but uh, the protesting people in, in Poland now are the youngsters, is the young generation. Um, maybe because uh, they are having an access to internet, maybe because uh, we joined European Union and we are not uh, stuck behind the Iron Curtain any longer. People go uh, around, move, see how the other lifestyle uh, are going on and they bring it back and they seem to be definitely much more open and tolerant but some, especially older generations, uh, seem to be um, really thinking uh, very much differently and quite far away from uh, presented today uh, principles related to cell, to the school policies, etc. Uh, and just one, one more comment. Uh, I, I would wish for something like that to happen, that I'm a, a little bit interested in, in issue, for example, like mobbing. Um, I observed mobbing on, uh, in various uh, countries on different continents just happening and, and destroying good stuff, uh, destroying their relationships within professional groups, um, bringing toxicity into um, uh, working uh, groups to such extent that it is falling apart. As I listen to the ideals, uh, fortunately, I, I often think about it as utopia of our project and the assumptions. It seems like we, um, um, we think that it's possible to create someone which is a opposition to being a mother. We, we would like to create someone who, who is open, empathic, tolerant, who is accepting, who is listening. And this is not a profile of a mobber who is an authoritarian, aggressive, imposing, destructive, selfish, uh, often narcissistic creature. So um, on one hand, I keep the fingers crossed for the project and my soul is in the project because um, I would like to be <laughs> a little bit like the, the ideal um, cell representative. I, I know I'm not. Uh, but then the reality of life bothers me a lot and the Polish context is um, really making me losing my sleep at night. Yeah, we understand that's uh, uh, a very delicate moment. Uh, so thanks for sharing. And, uh, and also to stress that there could be light and uh, especially in young generation, which I think it's, uh, it's a good point. And also I would like now to go back to Vladimir uh, because, uh, well, 
we are connecting a bit the dots and uh, and we see how the participation in the European Union can really be helpful to to create a more open uh, and progressive society and uh, and my question is uh, I don't know uh, how do you think I mean do you think that these social and emotional learning programs uh, with this uh, world system approach that we are uh, trying to conceive with the boost project should be really uh, embedded in the educational program uh, throughout Europe. Uh, what the European Union also can do a bit uh, in order to push the member states to take into consideration this, uh, this approach, these learning programs, uh, uh, beside, of course, uh, the, the, the key competence that you already presented, uh, and how we can move forward this discussion with the European institution also as a stakeholder, as what we can actually do uh, in order to really then uh, uh, see that the change happening on the ground at national level, at regional level. <clears throat> um, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I would say, uh, uh, I would uh, say that it is essential for uh, our children, <laughs> for the sake of the uh, the future of Europe, uh, being Poland or any anywhere else, uh, to have um, successful measures, successful projects, successful interventions. Uh, ideas, initiatives, all of the, this is exactly what the European Union is supposed to do. We share, we scale up, we try to help using financial instruments like uh, Erasmus Plus and, uh, uh, and Horizon 2020. Uh, so uh, what Boost is doing is uh, essential to the success of our efforts because all we are doing, in, I mean, at least uh, in my unit, is try to uh, connect the dots and to, to try to make sense of the numerous um, uh, projects and to try to figure out how to promote them across the EU and uh, to help member states to provide the platform, basically. This is what we do. We provide the platform for member states to, uh, to um, work together and to uh, bring out new ideas. Um, so, I mean, I really would like to pick on something that uh, Kertil, I'm not sure if this is the way it's pronounced, <laughs> the name, uh, said, which I think is the key uh, here. It's, he said something like, uh, actually creating obstacles to our children so that they could build resilience. In other words, uh, we should, uh, I mean, not by we, I mean the educators and, uh, uh, and policymakers, we should try to find the fine balance between being too sheltering and, uh, uh, and uh, on the other hand, neglecting the, uh, you know, the, the children in need. And as I said in my uh, initial intervention, I, uh, the, the European Union specifically speaks uh, on uh, our commission documents indicate underprivileged children. It is they who need uh, help. Uh, whether, you, whether you want to call it a trauma, a trauma school act or something, uh, it doesn't really matter. As long as you address the needs of the neediest of our uh, students. Uh, I, I just reacted to the, to the reference to the US because I myself am a US citizen and I, from what I read about this particular uh, legislation in the United States, it's aimed at uh, something that does not exist, I hope does not exist in, in the EU which is the so-called school-to-prison pipeline. And uh, uh, the funneling of students out of school, etc. So uh, put, putting them in the streets and juvenile correction system. So these are the issues that I, I uh, uh, as a, as a European-American, I feel uh, do not really apply to us. But uh, they do, in many ways, given um, in, in a wider context, because we do need to connect to uh, to help the uh, the students in distress uh, 
uh, doesn't matter what terminology we're using, but we do need to have uh, the um, focus, just like Germany. I mean, how did Germany actually achieve so much uh, success with their PISA results in, uh, I don't know, in, the pre in, uh, uh, in comparison to the previous cycles? Well, they focused on the underprivileged. They focused on students. For example, this uh, uh, COVID-19 issue uh, hits them the most. These are the students who need social and emotional support. And these are the students who lack broadband uh, capabilities at home. These are the students uh, who are falling behind and may end up in prison uh, for one, or, uh, one reason or another. So uh, we, uh, uh, so this fine balance between, and I, uh, I, I put this uh, little link, um, uh, social psychologist from New York University explains that we are maybe going a little bit too far in our sheltering and creating, we need to be, uh, to create these anti-fragile kids and not be afraid of, uh, to, in order to build resilience, we do need to be, uh, uh, to, uh, as Gatel said, uh, we need to balance between, um, you know, uh, the two approaches. That's, that's my two cents. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Vladimir. Also, thanks for uh, quoting the, the situation, the COVID-19, and also the vulnerable groups, if you want, in this case, students. Uh, and, uh, and this is perfect also a question to address to Ingrid, actually, because as she was mentioning before, uh, your health net is also keeping high health equity uh, in its agenda. Uh, yeah. So uh, the question is indeed uh, how, you know, COVID-19 shed a different light on mental health resilience of children, but in particular of those that are also part of vulnerable groups, and how we can address together all this. Uh, well, I think there's so much to be said also to the earlier points, and, uh, and maybe I'll start just by saying something I heard in an interview randomly, um, but that seemed so relevant to this debate, was that we tend to think of ourselves as cognitive beings that are sometimes emotional. And actually, it's completely the opposite. We're emotional beings that are sometimes cognitive. And so that's why um, social and emotional learning is so important, because we have to regulate our emotions. Students, children have to regulate their emotions in order to function and in order to learn. Um, and that's really the basis. So teaching them how to do that and also teaching them about what generates well-being, um, teaching not just children, but populations. But, you know, we know the research says it's social engagement. It's getting involved in what really drives you as an individual, finding that and, and, and really um, getting engaged in that and then contributing <laughs> to the social environment you're in. That's what builds well-being. So, yeah, and, and I also really do appreciate uh, Robert's comments uh, because I don't think it's just a Polish problem. I think uh, I couldn't help thinking, well, some of the leaders of democratic, the most oldest democracies at the moment could have really done with some more social emotional learning and, and look what the world would look like. So it's, it's a global problem and we're really at that interface. I mean, I think that's what the elections <laughs> in the U.S. were all about. And maybe we need that mob mentality towards, uh, so I'm also more economies of well-being that with the COVID crisis, people are so aware of health now um, at this point. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, that it has, it is at their forefront. So how can we help people build their health and well-being and, and use that now? Um, that hook, the, the opportunity that we're in. Um, and I also very much appreciate uh, Vladimir's comments just now regarding the importance of uh, really focusing on the underprivileged because that is the real threat again here, um, that the resources, um, that the threat that we always face in public health, health promotion, that those who um, uh, already have the skills and the abilities benefit most from these kind of programs. Um, and then it only widens inequalities. So really applying a principle that we hear a lot about when we're in the world of inequality, universal proportionalism, those who need it most should get the most attention. So universal programs, but particularly focused on those who, who need it most is what, uh, and yeah, COVID has really shed a light uh, again on this. Um, we say it's not a pandemic, it's not just COVID, it's a syndemic, it's aggravating all those underlying uh, problems that were already there and that's widening health inequalities. Um, we really see that, uh, well, amongst the people who struggled most was not just, well, older people, but also um, families with young children. And, um, and it's particularly those children in vulnerable families that, uh, well, that, that disappeared 
because they didn't they weren't connected they weren't part of the digital world um, and i think it, it showed again the importance of schools as a structure for particularly these children how you know um how they they are a lifeline for children and, and students and educators um if they are struggling at home because so many in, in so many cases it was those that were struggling who we just don't know what is happening uh, within those households when they are not being able to go to school. Um, so um, yeah it's it's initiatives um, so so really in these kind of initiatives really focus if, if policies can really focus those resources to develop these college kind of programs particularly in the schools that uh, that needed most and using those resources available. Um, uh, for example, maybe the child guarantee. I don't know, engaging with that, maybe there can be funds in the child guarantee um, that this, this agenda can also be placed there, social and emotional learning in schools, particularly to, to help vulnerable children um, and, and to reach out and, and, um, and through programs now in COVID that, uh, um, it's not just about schools, it's about the communities, but creating lifelines um, for these children and um, to help them uh, develop the skills they need to learn to learn because that's we the future is very uncertain. The digital world is very uncertain. Uh, you know, there lots of opportunities, but as Vladimir also said earlier, many, many threats uh, and um, and the answers all lie in building the capacity, the resilience of children to navigate this world um, and to discriminate between the information, the glut of information they're getting and to be able to process it properly in ways that, uh, that help them build their, contribute to build their well-being too. Thanks, Ingrid. Yeah. Indeed, uh, this kind of threats can create huge disparities and can create winners and losers, uh, especially in light of uh, the digital revolution. So uh, we totally agree that indeed what we should be able to do is, uh, yeah, to teach how to learn and uh, to navigate uh, uh, in the future with uh, sufficient self-esteem and, and, and confidence indeed. Um, in a positive way. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for your contribution. Now we still have uh, uh, some time for uh, questions. Um, there is indeed uh, um, there is a comment on the on the prenatal and perinatal psychology and epigenetics that should be taken into account when talking different behavior mental challenges of our children. I guess this is more uh, a remark uh, for our consortium and uh, for, uh, especially for those uh, uh, working from uh, the psychological and pedagogical side in the, in the building of this uh, uh, BOOS approach. Um, is there any other question from, uh, from the audience that you want to share with us in the chat before I'll give the floor maybe to uh, our coordinator for uh, a wrap up? I don't see any question. <laughs> so maybe yes, we can move forward uh, to to the conclusion with uh, with Stina. Um, as I said, our uh, boost scientific coordination. Uh, it would be nice to have some takeaway, also messages from your perspective, uh, since you were leading this. Uh, extremely useful exercise uh, that we truly hope can, uh, uh, can deliver results in the future. I see that Kato actually would like to add something. Sorry, so sorry, Stina. No, go we'll ahead. Give we, we give quickly the, the floor to Kato and then get back to you, okay? Mm, I'm sorry, I, I just uh, tried the digital race hand, but uh, it, it didn't <laughs> okay. work, but I guess. Uh, well, um, um, I would just like to, to mention, uh, and, and Stina mentioned it earlier, that, that uh, one of the approaches in, in this uh, project is, is uh, actually the or organizational development. So, uh, and, and uh, we, are, we are strongly uh, think that um, uh, uh, that uh, bullying um, and so that someone m mentioned earlier that that uh, this 
traditionally is is the view uh, viewed as uh, uh, a victim and and uh, and uh, uh, executioner or or a doer. So, uh, but it, but if we we actually um, try to understand the bullying in uh, in uh, a social context that that uh, that uh, all are are included in. Um, we really ni uh, need to to uh, to develop the pro professionalism and, and the knowledge uh, uh, in in the schools and and of course uh, this needs to be done uh, for all the school staff. So so uh, make uh, make uh, make the same rules as as uh, as uh, this uh, this behavior is not tolerated here and it it needs to. To be uh, be dealt with from from the whole school uh, staff. So so um, we really try to to view bullying as a as a phenomenon is in in a social context to to um, and and thereby uh, both um, both guide and uh, and uh, and uh, and moderate the the bullier uh, and the victim, uh, but also the participants and the and the audience. Uh, so, yeah, I strongly, strongly uh, uh, agree with uh, with um, uh, more of you. But but it's uh, it's important to to not uh, emphasize on the individual perspective uh, only. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Kaitu, Stina. Okay, um, how to sum up? Uh, I think this has been very interesting and I'd like to thank everyone for contributing and participating. Um, I think uh, uh, what, I've, what I take away with me is that um, the basis of the boost approach that I presented is being emphasized. It's, uh, Vladimir emphasized it very well. Also, uh, Ingrid also did that. Uh, social and emotional learning is essential for children's well-being um, today, but it's also essential for their academic achievement uh, and future job performance and performance in life in general. So we all agree that social and emotional learning is at the core of, of children's development and how we perform both as children, but also as adults later on. I found the discussion around, um, you know, the f how to find the balance between sheltering and giving children challenges and obstacles to overcome. I think this is a very fascinating discussion. And also, uh, it's a takeaway for me in terms of the further development of the boost approach. The, the whole idea of giving children challenges, I think is an extremely important challenges that they can overcome so that they can build resilience and build um, a feeling, a sense of self uh, in, in having achieved something. I think it's uh, fascinating and also very important. I think what we can all agree is that uh, we want to promote mental health and well-being in our young citizens. Um, and as Chetty said, this is built uh, through social and emotional learning, uh, which in turn, in turn builds stronger and more resilient adults. So we agree on the basics and the foundation for this. Um, how we get there uh, is much more challenging, I believe. Uh, what we see in our policy brief is uh, that schools lack mandatory plans and goals for working with social and emotional learning. So we're, they're asking for more clear strategies and goals for working with social and emotional learning. And on the other hand, they're also asking for strategies to be very flexible. <laughs> so it's, it's challenging. Uh, flexible challenge, uh, strategies adapted to the needs and resources of the school that are at the same time um, more clear. Um, I think what we need is general guidelines, uh, some general strategies and guidelines, some goals that everyone is going after, but that are still flexible because schools are different, countries are different. Um, so, so, so a very, uh, a very clear plan that everyone has to go by would not work. But at the same time, um, more mandatory goals and strategies, I think, uh, is a definite need. Um, I see now that the policy brief has already been put in the chat uh, and I, we will be launching our policy brief and making it available for everyone. Valentina, do you want to say something about this perhaps at the end? And then yes. I will just conclude to say thank you very much. I've had a very interesting hour and a half, I must say. Thanks, Tina. Thanks for uh, this uh, uh, brilliant wrap up of what has been discussed. Uh, yeah, uh, as I said, indeed, uh, uh, now the policy brief is out. 
and you can uh, download it um, on our website um, and please also don't forget to register to our newsletter uh, because there you will find also uh, information about this uh, these events for those that attend the events we will also share the powerpoints and all the information that you need uh, but please really follow us through the social media and uh, and through the website uh, to stay up to date with uh, um, the implementation of the boost project and of course for with you know other webinars and activities uh, in the near future um, so as I said the policy brief will be both in the downloads and the outputs of the of the project on the website pages uh, so check for that uh, otherwise you can also now use the, the chat to download the document directly um, thanks to everyone for taking the time for being with us today uh, I think it was very, very interesting and timely discussion and uh, we touched upon so many things uh, and we just realized that our work is more important than ever. Probably now it's more important than when we start uh, and uh, we are committed to deliver uh, results to the Boost project uh, for uh, all our countries involved and of course for, uh, for the European Union. So thanks everyone and uh, let's keep in touch. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.